I don't want to forget that. And so, um, <clears throat> but anyway, um, what I wanted to do is just, first of all, if you're uh, visiting our church for the very first time and you would be so kind as to take one of those uh, communication cards that's in the back of the seat in front of you, if you wouldn't mind filling that out and later on at the end of the service when, the, uh, when we receive the offering, if you wouldn't mind throwing that in the offering basket or just take it back to the welcome uh, table. We'd love to get to meet you and give you a little gift, and thank you so much for being in our church. So um, thank you. And this is a little atypical for you, too, if you're just checking us out. Um, I tell you this, I believe that this church is owned by Jesus Christ. He's the one that owns Park Valley Church. It belongs to him. And the reason is because he's the one that bled and died for it. He's the one that adds to it. He's the one that will love it more than we will ever love it. And I think I love it, Okay. <laughs> But I can't even begin to love it as much as Jesus loves it. He's also the one that said, it's impossible for anybody or anything to stop it. Nobody can stop my church. Not even Satan can stop my church. Not even the gates of hell can stop my church. We've already read that in the Bible. He says that over and over. Now, every time I read that verse, what I think is this. I think uh, what an awesome investment it is to be able to have uh, to be able to, to invest in the church, because it can't stop. It's impossible for anybody to stop it. It's the greatest investment in the history of earth. I would recommend that you give your time, your talent, and your treasure to the church, uh, because Jesus said, you know, it's a, it's a win-win investment. And so um, that's, you know, what I believe the church is. Now, I believe Park Valley Church is a healthy church. I really do. And I say that because Healthy things grow, and our church has been growing, and I thank God for that, and that's an awesome thing, and it's a privilege to be a part of a growing, thriving church. It's a blessing to be a part of that, and uh, I believe God's growing our church. Now, over the last year and nine months, just since we've been in this building, we have grown more than we did in our first seven years as a church in the school. Now, I can say this. You do not need a building to be a church. But this building has helped our church grow. It really has. And so to everybody who has sacrificed and d done whatever you possibly could to help this church buy this land and build this building, I want to tell you this. It has not been in vain because this church has grown as a result of God providing us this facility. It's, a, it's an awesome, awesome blessing. Now, in 2011, God changed a lot of lives. He did. God's the one that changes lives. And, and please know this. If you're just checking our church out, that's why, we, that's why we're here. I mean, we're here to grow in our faith, and we're here to get closer to the Lord, and we're here to have fellowship. But we're here as a concerted effort as a team to do what we can to change the lives of the people around this area. That's why we're here. And, and anybody who volunteers on any capacity at any level whatsoever is doing it for the sole reason, for the sole purpose of making sure that people's lives are changed by the power of Jesus. And I'll tell you, how many of you believe that people are struggling? Anybody believe that? Yeah. How many believe that Jesus has answers? Yeah, of course he's got the answers. And so we're trying to do whatever we can to introduce people to Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. So, you know, anybody who is on a welcome team or stands out with a reflective vest and waves at cars coming in or puts out donuts or makes coffee, we make coffee to change lives. Literally, we do it. That's why we do it. And yeah, hold the coffee up. Put your cups up. <laughs> like that grit song, you know. Um, I mean, literally, that's why we're here. That's why we exist, so that lives will be changed. Now, <clears throat> here's, here's one of the things that I believe, okay? A couple of things that this church has done, and it's not rocket science, but you guys got it, okay? Some people got it. Some people don't got it. You guys got it. You guys are, get this. You're nice to people. You're nice to people. Now, there's a big difference between a person that says, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and a person who treats people like they're a follower of Jesus Christ. There's a big difference there. You guys treat people like you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You're actually nice to people, and that's pretty awesome. Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> people aren't going to come here if we're mean to them, right? It's creepy enough checking out a church, but a creepy mean church? Forget it. I'm not going to a creepy mean church. I might check out a creepy church for a few weeks, but if they're mean, 
I'm walking out the door. I got an email from a lady who brought her family to the Christmas Eve service. And this is what happened. She brings her family to the Christmas Eve service. She walks in. She's greeted at the welcome table. Hey, thanks for coming to our church. We're glad you're here. We don't have any seats right now. And what we're doing is bringing everybody over to the uh, overflow venue. And she was like, I don't want to go to the overflow venue. I'm going to go in there where everybody else is sitting. You know, that kind of a situation. So she was going down the hallway, and I guess she did this covert operation where she opened up a door and she, she said, get it, go, go. She got the family in. And so she's in, or I don't remember how it worked, but she got the family in and she said this, I would rather stand the entire service and be in there so that I can get the experience of what it's like to be in the service at Park Valley Church. And so she comes in and she has her entire family standing on the side of the wall during the service. Now here's the amazing thing about that. The people of our church are watching this happen. And they say, you know what? That ain't going to happen here. So they start trying to do everything they can to get extra seats here and there and open up extra seats so that this family can not only just have, you know, onesies and twosies here, but so that they could actually sit together as a family for Christmas Eve. You guys sacrifice your seats so that they could have a seat. And she liked it enough to write an email about it. Not only did she say that, but something that was really funny. She said a couple of weeks before, they tried another church. And they walked into the church, and they found some seats that were available. And as they started to go towards the seat, in her peripheral vision, she saw another woman that also saw the same seats. You know what it's like when you're trying to go for that parking space at the supermarket, <laughs> and everybody's like gunning for it? Oh, I had my blinker on. I was waiting for that. You know? And everybody, for, for some reason, we're all like irritated and, and upset and, and fighting for things. She said that that woman literally ran and boxed her out and went into the seats and grabbed it for her family. She said, you know what? I never went back again. I know it sounds like a silly thing, but if you're nice, you can, God can use you to change people's lives. It's incredible. There's not a lot of niceness out there anymore, especially when it comes to churches that get old and crusty and fuddy-duddy and, and set in their ways and, and they, they don't see the big picture anymore. You know what? You guys get it. You guys see the big picture. Not only that, but you invite people to come to church as I kick my water over. You invite people to come to church. That's an amazing thing. Here's what I believe. Whatever you are proud of, you go public with. Whatever you love, you go public with. Anybody who invites people to this church is proud of this church and loves this church. And so what I want to say to you is thank you. Thank you for all year long in 2011 going public with your love and being excited about what's happening at this church and inviting people to come to this church. That's, it's an amazing thing. We had 204 families visit our church in 2011. If you times that by three, that's going to be what? Like... 600 and some people. <laughs> that's over 600 and some people that have come to visit. That, that's if a family of three. It's just 204 families. It may be a family of one. It may be a family of eight. You know, I don't know. But we had 204 families come, and a big percent of those people came back. And the reason they came back is because you care. You care about people. I'm going to tell you this. I believe it with all my heart. The statistic is true that people in the first eight minutes decide whether or not they're going to come back to a church. When they're walking down this aisle looking for a seat, they've already made it up in their mind. I'm never coming back. And it doesn't matter if the preacher preaches or if the band plays. They've already made up their mind. That's the way it works. And so it's the people that are out there welcoming people and with a smile and being nice to people that literally are advancing the kingdom. You think, wow, this is nothing. Oh, it's, it's so something. It's so huge. It's so important. God used you to change lives just because you were nice and you invited people to our church. We had 146 people baptized in 2011. 146 people baptized. And I can guarantee you this. Having done this for a lot of years, I guarantee you that we had at least double the amount of people make professions of faith in Jesus Christ. I will guarantee you that we probably had close to 300 people bow their head, and pray and receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. I mean, that's insane. That's incredible. 
We had 233 people join our church family through our 101 class. We started 20 new small groups, involved 200 new people in these groups, and Mark Brady led our small groups in a food drive where they got 8,000 cans of food and gave it to the Haymarket Food Pantry. I mean, that's incredible. Our D.C. Street Ministry, Kelly Schaefer and all the people that work so diligently, Jamie Smith and all those people that work hard with our D.C. Street Ministry, they took 410 people into D.C. this year. They passed out 1,500 meals, and of all of those meals that fed homeless people, 625 of those meals were hot meals. And we don't even have the capabilities of doing hot meals. I don't know how they do it. It's incredible. We took 200 kids to summer camp. We had between 3,000 and 4,000 people at Trunk or Treat, and we had 3,100 people at Christmas Eve. And in 2003, we started with 20 people. So here's the question. What do we do as a church when God adds two zeros to 20? What do we do as a church when God decides to take our church from 20 to 2,000? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to recognize that this is the wonderful, awesome, blessing building that God has given us. This is the land that God has given us. We have 20,000 square feet, and that's amazing. But with that 20,000 square feet, every single one of us, we all have to be very creative in the space that God's given us. And so what we've decided to do is, is we do multiple services. Every time you do multiple services, you get two benefits. The first thing is, is you give people a choice, and people love choices. They just do. You know, it's like a movie theater. You know, you're looking, well, what times do they have? Do they have anything around 7.30? Because that means we can eat dinner, and that, you know, and they never have movies in the 7 area. Do you ever notice that? That's the best time, and they never have them. But anyway, we, we love choices. And the same thing is true when we offer additional services at our church. People are like, hey, I can make that one. If I can give you four opportunities to worship Jesus on a weekend, you're probably more likely to worship Jesus on a weekend. And so we do, we love to give people choices. Coca-Cola has 3,500 different beverages. I thought they just had like Coke and Diet Coke and Cherry Coke, and caffeine-free Coke, and vanilla Coke. Do you know, they have every kind of beverage under the sun. Go to their website and look. They, you can search it alphabetically. They've got 3,500. You know why? Because choices work. The second benefit is this. Not only does the church grow every time we start a service, but it also increases our space by 100% with the same mortgage. We keep the same mortgage, and we give ourselves 100% extra space to be able to fill this place up and fill those kids' rooms up and tell people that Jesus Christ can change their lives. That's why we do four services. Now, we don't have any other church, but we, we don't have any other choice but to grow. We have no other choice. Here's our motto at Park Valley Church. So if you're just checking us out, our motto is this. As long as there's one person within driving distance of our church that doesn't know Jesus, we have to grow. And sometimes growing is painful, and sometimes growing means change, and sometimes growing means that we have to be very, very innovative in how we do church. But what I love about this church is this. You guys have always been down with it. You've been cool with whatever, you know, when it comes to Let's reach people for Jesus Christ, even if it means some inconvenience, even if it means some sacrifice. We've got to be innovative and growing within 20,000 square feet of this, in, in this building. So here's three things that I'm thinking about for the future. Number one, we're doing a thing called Saturday Night Drive, all right? Saturday Night Drive. And here's the thing about Saturday Night Drive. It's kind of like a coat drive, only we're doing a Saturday Night Drive. And Saturday Night is basically this. I, I remember, I used to dream about the day that I would walk into this church on Saturday and it would be full. The floor would be full, the balcony would be full, and I would walk in and I would go, oh my word, it's Saturday night and we pack, baby. You know, I would, I would always dream about that, that one day it would happen. Well, you know what? Guess what? It's been happening. Two weekends ago, we had 500 people in church. Not in the service, but all in every, every man, woman, and child we count pregnant women twice. We just do all that. <laughs> I count if you, you get counted, period. Um, but, I mean, that's, that, that would give us probably 350, 360 people in this room. And that's incredible. That's generally full, you know. And 
so anyway, we sent out one email and we asked people, hey, on Sunday mornings, people are coming in and not finding a seat. They're turning around and leaving. We don't want people to leave. We want people to stay. And so what we asked was, is those that are kind of been the PBC faithful, you've been hanging out for a while, you, you're growing in, in, in the Lord, and you're, you're doing everything you can to roll your sleeves up to help us reach this community for Jesus. We were thinking, hey, maybe you could come to Saturday night. Now, our goal is eventually to have not one Saturday night service, but two Saturday night services. And my goal eventually is to have 500 in each service. If we, if we can run 1,000 on Saturday night and 1,500 on Sunday morning, that's going to give us an opportunity to grow in the next five or so years while we're waiting to build our new facility. I'm just saying, you know, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to uh, grow. Here's, here's an email I got from a guy named Raymond Williams. He says this, we're enjoying church on Saturday night. And then he says, but it still freaks us out a little bit when we don't get up on Sundays. <laughs> I said, that's so cool. And the reason I thought that was cool, because that's how I grew up, man. I grew up, you went to church on Sunday morning, and if you're in bed on Sunday morning, you got a fever of 105. <laughs> and that's it, right? You go to church on Sunday. This whole Saturday night thing just doesn't cut it. You know, you ain't holy on Saturday night. So, um, but you know what? What does Paul say? Paul says in Romans 14 and 15, he says, it doesn't matter what day you worship the Lord. It's not about worshiping him on this day or that day or whatever day. And so there's a lot of people that are coming to Saturday night, and they're absolutely loving it, totally loving Saturday night worship. And then he says at the end of the email, it's a very short email, he says, we're definitely hoping, listen to this, we're definitely hoping and praying this helps the church to keep growing as it really is fun to see the growth. I read that email, and I said, you know what, sir? You get it. You get it. And people are getting it and understanding that we're, we're trying to do this. You say, well, I'm sorry, but Sunday morning is the only morning that works for us. Here's what I say. Come on Sunday morning. Whatever, whatever service works best for you, we want you here. But if you feel led of the Lord to come on Saturday night to help us to, to give some seats to folks on Sunday morning, then that, that's just an awesome thing. So Saturday night drive. The next thing is real quick is this, and I can talk too long. So and I got a whole message to preach. You're like, no. All right, real fast. There's this thing called that I, I, I named the 71% potential. And I think I put it in your notes. 71% potential. Now, I have absolutely no idea what anybody in this church gives. I don't know what you give. You can never look at me with a face like, uh, you know what I give. You can't look at me with pride and say, you know what I give, because I don't know what you give. You can't look at me and say, you know what I give, because I don't know what you give. You know, I don't know if, what, I don't know anybody, what anybody gives, unless they tell me. And sometimes people come and tell me. I give this. It's like, ah, you know, I don't want to know. <laughs> anyway, so I do know this, though. I know the percentages of what people give. And the reason I know the percentages is because Frank Jenkins came and told me, all right? And this is what he said. He said, 71% of the church gives $1,000 or less a year. 71% of the church gives $1,000 or less a year. And I thought to myself, wow, you know what? We got some major potential here. This is awesome. We got some major potential. And I thought to myself, <clears throat> you know, my whole life, most of my life, my parents always taught me to tithe. They taught me, Barry, you give first 10 per, the first 10% to the Lord. You give it to the Lord. You don't even think about it. You just give it. You don't give anybody or anything else, anything, until you give it to God. And what God basically says is this. I know that I know that I know, because I'm God and I made you, that if there's one thing that has the power to grab your affection more than anything else, it's money. And he says, I will not be second to Ben Franklin. I will not be second to money. I won't do it. I'm God, for goodness sake. And so I want you to keep me first in your money. So Christine and I have always tithed, and we just figured, hey, if we can trust Jesus for our eternal security in heaven, we can trust him with our money. And he has never failed us, ever. He has blessed us beyond belief. I'm telling you, as sure as I'm standing here, he has blessed us infinitely. Does that mean we have no problems? Oh, no, it doesn't mean that. He has lots of problems, all right? But he has blessed us and taking care of us. Now, if you take tithing and put it aside, and that sounds terrible to say, all right? Because I think we ought to, because the Bible teaches it. But even if this, 
Even if the 71% of the people said, we're not going to give 1,000 this year, we're going to give 1,500 this year. Even if they did that, from 1,000 to 1,500, in one year, just from that, if the 71%, now I recognize there's a big expanse between maybe somebody that gives 1,000, maybe somebody gives $10 a year or whatever. And praise the Lord for a penny, anything that comes in. God can take five loaves and two fish and feed 5,000 people. But here's the thing. If 71% of the people of our church gave $1,500 for the year, $125 a month, literally we would pay 25% of our debt off in one year by doing that. If 71% of the people said, we're going to go crazy and we're going to give $2,500 a year, $208 a month, we would pay off almost half of our debt in one year year. That's incredible. I sat back and I said, oh, Lord, thank you for the power and the potential of the 71%. And the blessing is this. You are generous and God blesses you. Look what the Bible says. And I didn't put it in your notes, so just trust me on this. Luke 6.38. I don't think I did anyway. It says, if you give, you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full measure. Pressed down, shaking together to make room for more and running over. Whatever measure you use in giving large or small, it will be used to measure what's given back to you. Love God. I'm going to tell you, this is a note from God. And God basically says this. If you give it to me, I'm going to give it back to you. And when I give it back to you, I'm going to give you that and some. And then you together as a church family are going to get to see a miracle take place. You're going to get to see your debt paid off. You're going to get to see your new building built. You're going to get to see the kingdom of God advance. And you're going to get to build something that's going to outlast your life. And I'm going to bless you every step of the way. I don't know. Win-win, I think, there. Third thing, and I'm not going to talk about it but one second, or a little longer than one second, but um, is the, t- is the two, roof, two Roofs project. And Two Roofs is kind of an interesting project because... It's, we're not going to do it now, but it's something we're thinking about, praying about. A two roofs project is basically the motto, two roofs are better than one until God decides to put us all back under one roof again, right? And, you know, if there was a facility or a school nearby that we could rent to have a, you know, sort of a satellite service very close by to where if this place was full, we could fill up another place and just keep, why? Because we have no other choice, I can't sit back and say, sorry, we're full. We can't grow anymore. We're done. I think I just want to do one service. It's a lot easier on the pipes. Can't do it. Makes me sick to my stomach. Sick to my stomach to think that we would stop growing. We can't. We don't have a choice to grow. So that means we together, collectively, put our brains together and make up innovative ways to continue to grow this church until God gives us another facility. I don't know about you guys. I'm just passionate about this. And I wanted to ask you a simple question. Would you help me and help this church win the world to Jesus? We can't sell ourselves short. We serve the God of the universe who can do anything. He owns all the money. He could use this church in absolutely amazing ways to reach this world for Jesus Christ. But it's going to take all of us to be dedicated to the cause. All of us. All of us to say, you know what, I'll make a sacrifice so that this church can grow. I'll do whatever it takes. We're going to get this church growing. We're going to make sure that the kingdom of God moves forward. You say, dude, I'm a first-time visitor. Chill. (laughs) Here's what I say. If you're a first-time visitor, I'm sorry, but you're in. You have no other choice but to come back next week, roll up your sleeves, and help us win the world to Christ. Sorry. (sighs) Guys, thank you so much for an awesome year. We're going to sing one song, and then I'll be back for a Miller message, just a short message. Stand and sing again with us, guys. We have been talking about a house divided. And the reason is because houses naturally divide. I believe they do. Satan is out to get us and destroy us and ruin our homes and ruin our families. And so what we need to do is make sure that we do everything we can to keep it all together and have harmony. And the Bible gives us very clear ways that we can do that. So my last message in uh, A House Divided is simply this. It's just two words. Ready? Don't quit. Don't quit. 
Don't quit. Don't stop trying. Thank you so much, Tim. <clears throat> Don't stop trying, you know, when it comes to keeping your house and keeping your home together. Uh, very, very important thing to do. Um, and I say this, don't quit a week from now, don't quit a month from now, don't quit a year from now, don't quit 20 years from now, stay at it, keep going, keep fighting, because it's going to be a fight, and it's going to be a struggle, but keep your homes together. Don't throw away a family because for these reasons, we've grown apart, we have nothing in common, I'm not happy, I met someone else. Those are not good reasons to ruin a family or separate a family or, or divide a marriage. Now, <clears throat> I think the key to not quitting is to understand whatever challenge that you're facing in light of the big picture or the scope of what God is doing in your life, what God's trying to do in you or through you in the kingdom of God, in the whole big picture of things. And there are several times that I've wondered how many, you know, how is it that Paul after he is beaten within an inch of his life, how does he not say, you know what, I'm done. I ain't doing this anymore. You know, I've been beaten enough. Look at my back. Look at what I've gone through. I didn't sign up for this. But yet he never quit. To his death, he never quit. And there were times I guarantee he wanted to quit. There were times I guarantee he was like, I am done with all of this. And then here's what happens in Ephesians chapter 3. In your notes, if you want to pull your notes out, look at these verses. You want to scratch um, notes next to them or underline the verses or circle. If you have your Bible, open up to Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. Here's what Paul says. And by the way, he says this from prison. Ephesians is a prison epistle. So he's writing this letter from prison. And he says this in verse 14. He says, when I think of the wisdom and scope of God's plan. When I think of the wisdom, oh my word, I have been through so many struggles in my life, so many challenges in my life, but I, now I see the wisdom in it. Now I see what God's doing. Because I take that challenge and I take that struggle and I place it against the backdrop of the scope of the whole thing, the big picture, what God's trying to do in the kingdom. And he says, I really only have one, one choice. All I can do is fall on my knees. I just fall on my knees and I pray to God the Father. I pray to the creator of everything in heaven and earth. I worship him. And then he says what? Now I want to pray for you. And these are the things that I want you to have. And I really believe that Paul wouldn't say, I want you to have these things unless he felt like he had them already. I'm writing, to you th I'm writing this to you from prison. And I see the wisdom in all God's doing in the scope that all of these, in the whole big picture of what God's doing in the kingdom through me. He says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will give you mighty inner strength through his Holy Spirit. We are so busy at trying to get the outer strength in, you know, in, in tune. I want my abs. I want my, you know, I got to be strong on the outside. We don't spend any time on trying to be strong on the inside. And you know what? We're falling apart. And we're looking good falling apart because our abs are there. You know? But the fact of the matter is we're falling apart because we don't have any inner strength. And we're not doing anything. We're not taking the time that's necessary to formulate that inner strength in our life. You know what? There are forces and things going on around you and people around you that are watching you and they're wondering, when's he going to crack? When's he going to break? When's he going to quit? When's he going to throw in the towel? And you look back and you look at all those people and you say, not going to happen. Got inner strength, no abs, but inner strength. <laughs> Got the Holy Spirit of God inside me. And he has given me the inner strength that I need to not crack, to not quit, to not throw in the towel to not break. I see this challenge and I see this difficulty against the backdrop of the scope of what God is doing in my life. And I see the wisdom in it. I see what God's trying to accomplish. He's given me inner strength, verse 17. And I pray that Christ be more and more at home in your hearts as you trust in him. Wow. We're always a lot more comfortable with 
and we're a lot feel more at home with people that we trust. People that we don't trust, it's always like we're always looking at them like, what are they thinking? What are they doing? We don't feel at home with them. Here's what Paul says. I want you to feel at home with Jesus. I want you to trust Jesus. I want you to know that he is going to protect you, and he's there for you, and he hasn't left you hanging out there to dry by yourself. He's not going to do that. Be at home in your hearts with Jesus. He says, and I pray, uh, actually the second part of the verse, he says, may your roots grow down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. His love. The roots of my life to grow deep into his love. That gives me nourishment to keep going every single day. And it gives me protection when the storms of life blow and I'm going back and forth. But my roots are deep and they're anchored in his love. And I don't even get his love. I don't get it. How can he love me as much as he loves me? How can his love be so awesome, so huge, so big? What does Paul say? That you may have the power to understand as all God's people should, how wide and long and how high and how deep his love really is. And then I don't want you just to read about it. Verse 19, I want you to experience it. I want you to see it in your life. Then you're going to be filled with the fullness of life and the power that comes from God. So what do we do? Three very quick things and we're done. Number one, how do we wrap up this series saying, don't quit. Number one, we say this, with your life, worship the creator. With your life, worship the creator. Can I say this for a minute? <clears throat> Everything in life, every problem in life boils down to a worship problem. It really does. Every single problem boils down to a worship problem. You see, everybody in this room was made to worship. You say, oh yeah, really? Well, worship's just not my thing. I'm going to tell you this. Trust me, it's your thing. Because you were made to worship, you know. You were made to worship. And you are actively worshiping every single day. You're like, chill, I'm not worshiping. Trust me. Trust me. You are worshiping every day. Now, there's only two things you can worship. You can either worship the creator or you can worship creation. When you worship creation, it's called idolatry. And when you're an idolater, everything falls apart. Life doesn't make sense. Life is unfulfilling. Anything that you would worship other than the creator causes life to go haywire. Here's what the Bible says. Romans 1.25, instead of believing what, the, what they knew was truth about God, they deliberately chose to believe lies. So they worshiped the things God made, but not the creator himself, who is to be praised forever. Amen. Everything goes haywire when you don't worship the Creator. Why do you think the first commandment out of the Ten Commandments is worship God and God alone? Don't worship anybody or anything else other than the Creator, other than God. Because when you do that, everything else falls into place. You're not going to be concerned with the idol of sex outside of marriage. That's an idol. You're not going to be concerned with the idol of murder or the idol of lying or the idol of stealing because you're worshiping the creation and not the creator. God says, worship me. Do you understand how everything is going to fall into place if you put me first in your life? Man, just trust me on this. Trust me on this when it comes to worshiping me. Worship him with your life. Number two. With your marriage, develop a friendship. With your marriage, develop a friendship. I think what happens in our marriages a lot of times is we're just not friends anymore. We're not friends anymore with our, our husband or wife. Song of Songs or Song of Solomon 516. It says, his mouth is altogether sweet. By the way, this is a woman talking about her man. All right? She said that his mouth is sweet. Let me ask you this question. Would your wife say that about you? Would your wife say that his mouth is sweet? Sweet stuff comes out of his mouth. He's nice. He's encouraging. You know? Sweet mouth. That'd be a nice little nickname, wouldn't it? <laughs> hey, what's up, sweet mouth? 
All right. His mouth is altogether sweet. He is lovely in every way. Such, O women of Jerusalem, is my lover and what? My friend. I'm going to tell you something. The marriages that we have are friendships. I met Christine at Liberty University. We were in the library. I went early to the library and no one was there. So I took an entire table and filled the whole table up with books and I was doing a paper on whatever. I think it was pantheism. So I'm doing this paper and um, as the evening goes on, the library fills up and I'm the only one by myself sitting at an entire table because I have books all over the place. So Christine walks in and she has her books and she walks up to the table and she goes, And I said, I, I, I looked at her and I went, <laughs> sit down. <laughs> it was funny. And then I said, hey, can I walk you back to your dorm? She said, yes. I walked her back to her dorm. We got to her door. And I said, you know what? I think, what do you think, rather, about maybe us going out next semester? She said, sure. I said, great. I said, what do you think about us going out this semester? <laughs> she said, yes. I, it got quiet. I went, what do you think about us going out tomorrow night? <laughs> she goes, I'll check my schedule and get back with you. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this. We spent time together every single day from that moment on. We were together in the evening. We were together during the day. And as, the reason we were together is because we wanted to be. Couldn't wait to get together. And a lot of times in our marriages, what happens as, as we're married and as life goes on, it's like now we're going two different directions. Now we're like, yeah, you're cool, man. You just do whatever you want. You're going ahead. Go shopping. Sure. I'm going to sit here and watch TV. Or I'm going to do this. Or I'm gonna, and we're okay with going different directions, you know. And that's what happens over time. And we lose that friendship. Mark Driscoll there's a great pastor out in Seattle, Washington. He talks about the fact that a friendship is a face-to-face -face relationship. It's a face-to-face -face relationship. The problem with marriages is we're too busy being back-to-back, -to -back, going different directions. And sometimes we're too busy being shoulder-to-shoulder. -shoulder. And that's good to be shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder because you got stuff to do, places to go, schedules, kids, school events, sports, your shoulder-to-shoulder, -shoulder. The problem is this, one day the kids grow up and leave. And all that shoulder to shoulder time disappears. It is absolutely vital that we have friendships. It's absolutely vital that we have time face to face. Why do you think in 1 Corinthians, the Bible says one day you'll truly know what Jesus is like because you will be face to face with him. So you need to spend time talking to your wife, to your husband. Just spend time talking. You're like, I don't want to talk. Talk anyway. Sit down face to face and spend time. We have people of all ages in here right now. So I'm just going to say this. I think also that husbands and wives need to have plenty of intimacy. <laughs> you know what I mean. Number three, with your desires, obey God no matter what. With your desires, obey God no matter what. Now, there's always a reward connected to obedience. There always is. And you may not feel like you want to obey. And you may not feel like this is going to fit or it's right or you've talked yourself out of it. Trust me on this one. If God wants you to do it, then you do it. Now, when it comes to marriages, a lot of times we think things like this. Trust me on this, Barry. I'm working on it. I'm trying. I've been trying for years. I'm not stupid. You know, people come up to me and they say, well, you just need to love him. You're like, duh. I know that. I know I need to love him. I know I need this. I know I need to love her. I know I, you know, I'm working on it. I'm trying. I know what I'm doing. And you know what? I've worked hard and I haven't been successful. It reminds me of the time when Jesus was teaching in a boat and he finished teaching, and he told Peter, he said, Peter, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get back in the boat. I want you to go back out in the deep, and I want you to put your nets down. And Peter looked at Jesus and said, 
I know what I'm doing. You're a preacher. I'm a fisherman. I've worked all night. We didn't catch one fish. And you want me to go back out and try again? Really? This is what Peter says. We worked all night. We caught nothing. And then here's the part that gets me in my heart. He says this. But if you say go back out, I'm going back out. If you say do it, I'll do it. Maybe you're sitting there in your marriage, and you have worked, and you have tried, and, and you are ready to throw in the towel, and you feel that still small voice of God saying, launch back out. Don't quit. Try again. Peter goes back out with that boat. They catch more fish in that one time than they can even bring in with one boat. Another boat has to come out. Both boats come back in completely filled with fish. You know why? Because there's always a blessing attached to obedience. I'm telling you, it's true. You know what? A lot of people quit right before their miracle. A lot of people quit right before they have that breakthrough. All I'm saying is this. Don't do it. Hang in there. I want our servers to come right now. As the servers come, we're going to have the, receive the, the Lord's Supper. And as, as they're coming, let me ask you this. And I, I ask this all the time. I would like for you just to hold the bread and hold the grape juice so we can all have it together. You know, the temptation is just pop it in your mouth. Don't pop it in your mouth. Hold on to it. Hold on to the bread and the grape juice. Now, while they're passing everything out, let me say this. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 38 and 39, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he's going to be crucified. Right before he's going to give his life and shed his blood for the world. And the Bible says that when he gets to the Garden of Gethsemane, he says this, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Now, sometimes I might say that if I miss lunch, right? Because <laughs> I'm kind of dramatic. But here's the deal. What would the Son of God and God the Son be meaning if he said that? I can guarantee you he wasn't just being dramatic. And I can guarantee you he wasn't just trying to make people feel sorry for him. The Bible says that he was so filled with anguish and grief that he, was, he felt close to death, and he was close to death. And then he says this, would you just stay here and watch with me, pray with me, verse 39. He went a little farther, fell on his face on the ground, and he prayed this, my father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me, yet I want your will, not my will. So here is a 100% man, 100% God, a hypostatic union, He's too, he's as much God as he's never been man, much man as he's never been God. He's getting ready to die on the cross for us. And he says, if there's any other way that I can pay for the sins of the world, God, would you please let me know what that is? Is there another route we can go? He says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He was obedient when it came to the death of the cross. So when I think about his obedience for the death of the cross... I take a step back and I realize, hey, Jesus, thank you very much for not quitting on me. Because he could have quit on me, but he didn't quit on me. And he was obedient when it came to taking care of me and my sin. Now, every time we have communion, we remember a couple of things. We remember his passion. It's almost as if Jesus says, whatever you do, don't forget my sacrifice for you. Don't forget how much I love you. And every time we're confronted with that passion of the Christ, we get a kick in the seat. Every one of us do, and you have to admit it. Every time you watch the movie, The Passion of the Christ, what does that do to your day? What's that do to you? I'm going to tell you something. It totally gives me a kick and gets me back on track and puts me in the place where I'm supposed to be. So the first thing we need to do is this. As believers, as believers... We need to make sure that we do an inventory of our lives. Where am I when it comes to an inventory of my life? Is there stuff in my life as a believer that shouldn't be there, that doesn't belong there? And I'm holding on to it. And God says, look, you know, 
I don't want you to worship anything else but me. I want to be first in your life. And so he gives us an opportunity to put him first. Communion is an opportunity for you to do a spiritual inventory and confess things in your life that don't belong there and turn away from them. The word repent means to turn and not do it anymore and get it out of your life. The second thing is this. It gives a chance for a person who's not a believer to become a believer. It's the greatest thing in the world. We never police communion. We never say, oh, give me your date of salvation, salvation testimony. All right, give him bread. She doesn't get bread. He gets a half a piece of bread. You know, <laughs> you know we're not doing that. <laughs> the reason we're not doing that is because, number one, it's impossible. Uh, but number two, it's also a great opportunity for people to have the elements in their hand, the symbol of his body and blood in their hand. What a great object lesson for a person to come to faith in Jesus Christ. We have a lot of people that come to our church that are seekers, that aren't believers just yet. And so what I say to them is this. I say, why would you want to receive the symbolic Jesus before you receive Jesus? It doesn't really make any sense that you would want to receive the symbolic Jesus before you receive the real Jesus. And so here's what we do. I want to have a word of prayer, and I want to try to accomplish both of those things. I want to pray first for our church, for the believers that are here. And then we'll pray for those who want to put their faith and trust in Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, for all of us as believers, we sit here in awe of what you did for us. Your sacrifice for us is incredible. It's amazing. And all we can do is say thank you. Thank you for spilling your blood. Thank you for breaking your body for us. And I pray, Father, that if there's something in our lives and we know what it is, Lord, that we would name it, that we would confess it, that we would repent of it, that we would turn away from it, and that we would change, Lord, bring change to our lives, even as believers. And Father, for those that don't know you, I pray, Lord, that they would, in just a second here, bow their heads and pray and accept you as Lord and Savior of their lives. In Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here this morning and you've never received Christ as your Savior, the real Jesus, by putting your faith in him, then I'd like to ask you to pray a simple prayer. Why don't you pray something like this? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm empty inside without you, and I don't know a lot about religion or the Bible, but I know a lot about me, and I know I need you. I know that you're the source of hope and joy and change. And so, Lord, I pray that you would forgive me of my sin, come into my life, and be my Savior. I want you to know from the bottom of my heart that even though I struggle with doubts, I believe. I choose today to be a believer in Jesus, that he died for me, that three days later he rose from the dead for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Dan. For this is what the Lord himself said. And I pass it on to you just as I received it on the night when he was betrayed. The Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and you, sealed by the shedding of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life for us. Help us now to give our lives back to you.
Jesus' name, amen.